Hiya, I'm Bruce Fumi, and I want to tell you about the Second War of Scottish Independence. You see, when somebody says the Wars of Independence, we all think about the First War of Independence. William Wallace, Robert the Bruce, James Douglas, Edward Longshanks, and of course, the Battle of Bannockburn. But how much do you know about the Second? If you fancy finding out, then this is a video for you. Now, if you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then you can click on the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. If you want more information, books, etc., then they are in the description below. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. Okay, so this is the first of a three-part series on the Second War of Scottish Independence, where I'll take you to key sites in Scotland and England. Now, we've probably all heard that saying, Scottish kings are like buses. The First War of Independence was caused because Alexander III died and there were no Scottish king for ages. The Second War of Independence was fought because we had two Scottish kings at the same time. But let me give you a bit of context. Robert the Bruce died in June 1329. Actually, one of my most popular videos is the one that commemorates his death, and I'll leave a link to that at the end. But Bruce had done well. He'd won the First War of Independence against Edward I of England, Edward II of England and all the odds. He'd arranged the Treaty of Edinburgh and Northampton that brought peace with our southern neighbours. The Pope had accepted Scottish sovereignty and sent holy oil to anoint future Scottish kings. And in anticipation of his death, Bruce had appointed two trusted guardians of Scotland. He'd left Scotland in a strong and stable position. And yet... Under the Treaty of Edinburgh and Northampton, the English Crown would recognise the Kingdom of Scotland as fully independent. Robert the Bruce and his heirs and successors are the rightful rulers of Scotland. The border between Scotland and England is that before the First War. The English couldn't cross the border to invade, and to seal the deal, David, the four-year-old son of Robert the Bruce, was married to Joan, the seven-year-old sister of Edward III. The treaty was made on behalf of Edward III, who was the English king, but as a minor, it was negotiated by his mum and her lover. His dad, Edward II, wasn't around. Some say he'd had a red-hot poker rammed up his... The point is, it probably didn't happen. Anyway, what the treaty didn't do was to accommodate the Anglo-Scottish nobility who'd sided with the English and been dispossessed by Robert the Bruce soon after Bannockburn. Seen as traitors to his cause, they were stripped of their Scottish lands and titles, and, surprise, surprise, they simmered with resentment. Also, young Edward III thought mummy and lover had made a shameful peace. There may be trouble ahead. Robert the Bruce had prepared for death by appointing two faithful lieutenants as guardians of Scotland, and he'd also given one of them, Sir James Douglas, the job of taking his heart on a suicide mission to crusade. And those two jobs weren't really compatible. You know that thing when the boss brings you and a colleague in and says to the colleague, I want you to look after my son when I'm gone, give him wisdom and teach him to be a good king. Oh, and you, Sir Douglas, could you go on this suicide mission? There might be a promotion in it for you. Anyway, shortly after, Scotland was a guardian down. On the other side of the border, in 1330, Edward III of England came of age. He had his mother's lover executed, and he wanted to undo this shameful peace with Scotland. Now remember, this whole debacle had started back in 1292, when Edward III's granddad, Edward Longshanks, had installed John Balliol as King of Scots. Robert the Bruce's ascendancy had left Balliol's son, Edward Balliol, the most dispossessed of all the dispossessed nobility. Imagine that you were an heir to the throne and now you're pimping personal appearances and considering American citizenship. The son of John Balliol was a perfect figurehead to send to Scotland to reclaim the throne from David II, the young son of Robert the Bruce. In creating the disinherited back in 1314, Robert the Bruce had set a ticking time bomb, which went off in September 1332. Because of the Treaty of Edinburgh and Northampton, Edward III couldn't cross the border and invade Scotland. But if a group of disgruntled, dispossessed nobles happened to sail round the border up the North Sea, fund them? Who me? 
On the 6th of August 1332, Balliol's supporters landed at Kinghorn in Fife, with the intention of regaining Edward Balliol the kingdom that his father had lost, so that they could get back the lands that they'd lost. They headed through Fife towards Perth, but two Scottish armies were on their way to crush these upstarts. The dispossessed came across the first of these Scottish armies just south of the modern Dublin estate here, by the River Erne outside Perth. The Loyalist Scots, who had much larger numbers, held the land north of the river and the bridge to get over it. They were complacent. The dispossessed were going to have a hell of a time trying to cross the river and attack. Just wait them out as our other force approaches. No need to post sentries. They can't cross the river. As the loyal Scots slept, the dispossessed found a ford and crossed the river. Oh. Not only that, the next day these hardened professionals positioned themselves perfectly. There's a link to the book Battleground Perthshire in the description below and it tells us that the southern forces formed a defensive arc at the head of this narrow gully so as to nullify the larger loyalist numbers. Archers on the higher ground up here on one flank, they were also positioned on the other and at the rear. Men of arms and spearmen here in the centre awaited the somewhat disorganised and impetuous Scottish charge. The southern longboats were devastating, as they would be for the next hundred years. The first Scottish shelter was largely cut down behind me. Bodies piled up here as they entered the archer's killing zone. Arguments about who had the honour to attack first meant that the overeager second shelter rushed headlong into the fray, and all this did was press their own men in front onto English spears. The bodies here were piled so high the only way to escape was to clamber over their hapless and erstwhile valiant comrades. This field was full of death. Many of those that survived were cut down in the retreat back to Perth. The second army didn't arrive in time to prevent Balliol from getting to Perth and having himself crowned as King of Scots at Schoon. The Loyalist leader brokered a truce with Balliol, ostensibly so that a parliament could decide on whether to endorse him or the boy David. The last 40 years of turmoil in Scotland started with two competing potential kings, John Balliol and Robert the Bruce. It seemed it was set to continue with Edward Balliol and David Bruce. Have you picked a side? Edward Balliol issued public letters swearing loyalty to Edward III of England, ceding lands and towns to Edward, stating that Scotland had always been subject to England and promised to support an English king in any future conflict. Now have you chosen a side? So now there were two kings of Scots. The boy king, David II, was so young that he couldn't be involved in frontline politics. And the man king and dirty, slimy, scum-sucking son of a tomb tabard, Edward Balliol, who was so sure of his position that he made his base not Perth, not Stirling, not even Edinburgh, but way down in the borders in Roxburgh. Shortly after, Balliol moved his base to Annan, right in the Solway Firth border where his father had had lands previously, and where flight to England was a hop, skip and a jump. As it was, he'd had to make that hop, skip and jump in his underwear, because Loyalist forces attacked at night when he was in the toilet. So he was genuinely caught with his trousers down, and he had to flee to England like that. Now, even if that story turns out not to be true, I still want it to be, don't you? Either way, on the 16th of December, less than three months after having been crowned here at Schoon, for one reason or another, he was fleeing, semi-naked, in the frost, back to England. Scotland had fought off another English takeover. I say that, but Edward Balliol seems to me very much like Malcolm Canmore 300 years before. Somebody else had taken his dad's place as King of Scots, and he came north with English support to try and regain the throne for himself. Did Malcolm Canmore have a more justifiable claim, or just a better publicist? Robert the Bruce was pretty duplicitous himself. Maybe if he'd offered those Anglo-Scots conciliation instead of demonisation and disinheritance, he could have saved a lot of pain and had a united, independent Scotland. Maybe that's something to think about, if Scotland gains independence again. Or maybe humans are inherently selfish, vengeful and destined for endless cycles of retribution. Just a cheery thought to end on.
Feel free to give me the thumbs up and support the channel below and look out for the next episode in the Second Scottish War of Independence. I mean, Doc is going to be la my life. Cheer and drastic.